saw you jump. <laughs> hey, welcome to Grace. I'm Chris. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and I am so glad you're here today. And, and here's what I know. There's so many new people here that I, I've been getting to meet at the door. I, I try to hang out at the lobby before and after, and I'm excited about it. I'm excited to get to meet you, and, and if you are new here, would love to meet you as well. And here's what I want to I say, is if you are new here and you're saying, man, I, I want to know more about this church and what you believe and how you operate, the, the, we have a way for that. It's called our Grow Class. Grow Class one, we talk about who we are, what we do, what we believe, how we operate, but we also in that class give you some tools, some basic tools on how you can grow to know and follow Jesus. We do that every month, the second Sunday of every month. Matter of fact, there's one going on right now in the building uh, behind this one, and so we'd love for you to be a part of that next month. You can sign up or get more information through the QR code. Now, the second way that you can find out more about who we are is this last fall, we did a series called We Are. It was in August. Um, where we talked about our mission, our vision, our strategy. It was uh, a four-week uh, series where we went through those things, and we'd love for you to go check that out on the, the YouTube page or on our website. But we'd love to help you know more about who we are, and we'd love for you to join us on our journey. It's an exciting journey. It's exciting, not just because rooms are full, but because we're seeing people give their life to Jesus, and we celebrate them uh, each month as, as we celebrate baptisms. That's what fires me up. Not only that, last week we had almost 300 kids in, in, in our kids' ministries, and that's just like elementary through intermediate. That is fantastic, and why that matters. Yeah, we can celebrate that. Imagine if God captures their heart as a kid, the story they get to tell of a lifetime of walking with Jesus. How amazing would that be? That's my heart. That's our heart as a church, and, and we're excited about that. So because there's more people coming, we, we believe God has put us here to inspire and equip people to know and follow Jesus, and so we want to continually make more room for, God, for those that God has put us here to reach, and so that's why we added the 1230 service last uh, fall. And, and if you're able to, to, to serve 11 and, and attend 1230, we would love for you to help us do that, just to continue to make more room for those who aren't here yet. And if you can't, that's fine. Totally get how rhythm of life works. But we would love it if you can. And plus, think about it. That person who's like, man, I can't get up in time for church. Now they can. All right. They don't have an excuse. You can bring them to 1230. Okay. Uh, another way that we're, we're, we're trying to make more room for those who aren't here yet is through our Uncharted Initiative. And many of you have made faith commitments to help us carry out God's mission of his church as we make more room to reach more people. And, and if you don't know about that, we want you to know about that. You can find out about that through the QR code. The, click on the button that says Uncharted or go to gf.church slash Uncharted. But for those of you who are already on that journey and we're excited, something exciting happened just a couple weeks ago, all right? This is them drilling to get core samples. And while this may seem minimal, I was so excited. I was giddy out there watching them dig in the dirt, all right? Because it means that things are happening and it is really exciting. I want you to know we're going to continue to update you as things go along the way. But this means that things are moving, right? And so we're still in the planning and permitting phase. There's still a lot more to go before we see big things happen. But I'm going to celebrate every step along the way. Well, last week we started this series called Playbook. I'm going to say up front, I know the play on the screen behind me doesn't work. It's not a real play, all right? You don't have to tell us anymore, all right? <laughs> However... We started this series last week uh, called Playbook, and Pastor Rocky challenged us with this question, to ask ourselves the question, what do you do to make it easy to be married to you? And I didn't think that was a very nice question to ask him, just saying, but, but it was a challenging one. It was a very good question to ask. And he says, man, what, is it, what, what do you do to make it easy to be married to you or, or to be your friend or be your coworker or to be your boss? What, what are you doing to make it easy for other people to connect with you to relate with you. Now, I know that not everyone is married and maybe you have no plans of getting married, but please hear me. This series is not just for married couples. This is for having meaningful relationships that honor God. And much and most of the passages that we are going to cover in this series aren't marriage-specific passages. There are passages that talk about how to have great relationships, period. So, so here's the thing. Don't write us off. Don't write this off, but lean in. And here's why I want you to know we're speaking directly to marriages, because marriage was God's idea. He invented it. He created it. And he created it to be great. He, he cares about marriage, and so we care about marriage. 
And I know that marriage is under attack. And I know that there's many marriages that are barely hanging on. So as a church, because God cares about marriage and he's given us a great design for marriage, we want to be a place where people are able to build unbreakable marriages. So we're absolutely going to speak to God's design for marriage and help people navigate marriage. One of the things that we're doing is a short-term group that's specifically for, to help with this. It's, I think it starts next week. Uh, you can sign up through the QR code or, or stop by the hub, but it's a short-term four-week group that will help with marriage, help with, with, with building great marriages. But most of what we're going to talk about is just about great relationship advice. So here's what I want to ask everyone to do, married or not. Let's lean in today and believe that God has something specific to say to you. Let's pray right now and ask God to do that. Father, will you speak to us today? And Holy Spirit, will you move in this place? God, I know I need you. We need you. We ask that you would change our hearts. You change our lives from the inside out through the power of your Holy Spirit and that you speak to us and open our eyes to your truth today. Ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Somebody didn't listen to Michael. Um, I'm so sorry. I don't know. <laughs> God, hey, go ahead and answer it. We're all going to listen. Just kidding. I'm sorry. I wouldn't do that to anyone else. I want you to know that. I know him. We're friends. That's Chris. All right. So if you're like, I'm never coming back to this place. All right. Just, just don't get to know me well, and I won't make fun of him. Just kidding. <laughs> Stop it. All right. I'm totally off the rails. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this last fall, I got to coach my boys in flag football in a league that we have here called Grace U Sports. I love it. We have an NFL flag football league that plays right here on our campus, which I love that we get to use the facilities God has given us for our community. And so I love it. I love getting to teach kids the game of football because I enjoy it. But more than that, I love to demonstrate God's love and, and be able to tell these kids that God has a plan for their lives. That is so much bigger than sports, so much bigger than any accomplishment that God wants to do something incredible in their lives. And so I love it. But one of the things we do, we teach them routes and plays and how to, uh, how, how to uh, play defense and these kind of things. So for my team, one of the things we do is we begin to teach them plays and they get these wristbands and have a play card, right? And, and, and so I'll call a play and they'll look on their play card and they'll line up and hopefully they'll run the play. And I say hopefully because sometimes it looks more like a Chinese fire drill than a play, Right? It doesn't quite always work out the way it looks that it's designed. But all of that's part of the communication of the game. And at every level of the game, there's forms of communication. At college, you'll see these random play cards on the sidewalk. And you're like, what? I mean, on the sidelines. You're like, what in the world do these things mean? Well, every single one of these cards, some of them just try to throw off the throw off the other team from stealing their signs. But all of the, the ones that do mean something, they communicate blocking scheme, they communicate coverage, they communi communicate what routes to run, they communicate what play to run. I mean, it communicates so much at every level. These these forms and ways to communicate. And, and in fact, today at the Super Bowl, there's gonna be uh, people, coaches in the, in the press box who are gonna communicate down to the coaches on the sidelines who are gonna communicate through it like this one-way radio to the, to the quarterback's uh, helmet. He'll, he'll do like this and he'll listen for the play then he'll tell the team, the team will line up and then he'll communicate to the team, uh, you know, the, the, the linemen that he sees and the defense and, and, and a blocking scheme. They'll communicate with each other and, then, and, and, and what routes to run sometimes. But then, but then sometimes the quarterback gets up there and he doesn't like the way the defense lined up and he thinks, man, my play's not going to work. So he calls an audible. And so he yell, kill, kill. And he's not being overly aggressive, okay? He's changing the play, all right? And matter of fact, the legendary quarterback, Peyton Manning, that his, he was famous for kill, kill, Omaha, Omaha, right? And he was changing the play. He was saying, hey, we're going to go to a different play. The defense has their own set of signs and, and ways to communicate. Now, here's why all of that matters. Because they've learned this and they know this that if communication breaks down at any level, it could mess up the entire play. And not will it mess up the entire play, it will hurt their chances of succeeding together as a team. And the reality is true about the way that we communicate. That when our communication breaks down, it hurts our ability to, to successfully navigate relationships in marriage creates conflict, it, it, it causes hurt feelings and 
and, and uh, resentment, confusion, conflict. But we communicate for so many different reasons. There's so many levels of communication. There's basic information. You know, basic information. It's cold outside. Hey, hey uh, uh, supper's ready. I was late to work today. Uh, the kids are on the roof again. Uh, <laughs> not y'all? Okay, just us, all right. Uh, Check engine light is on, All right? Basic information. Then there's coordination information. Hey, let's meet for lunch at 1130. Hey, hey let's take your car to the shop uh, before work tomorrow. Hey, uh, can you pick up the kids? Just coordination information. And this is, next step is where it gets a little bit tougher. Conflict resolution communication, right? Because we're really good at identifying the conflict. We're just not so great at resolving it. And then there's, we communicate connect relationally. And in fact, the better we connect relationally, the better our marriages will be, the better our relationships will be. But the problem is it's become more and more difficult to just connect in this way, to communicate at this level. Because for some reason, we've begun to trade face-to-face for screen-to-screen. And all research will tell you it is absolutely not the same. And not only that, screen to screen is beginning to damage our ability to connect face to face. One study I came across said that Facebook alone was the cause of 25% of a couple's fight each week. In fact, 40-something percent of divorces listed Facebook as a cause. Another study showed that one in seven spouses considered divorce because of the social media habits of their spouse. And here's why, because what we're communicating through our social media habits is that I'm more interested in what's going on out there than connecting with you right here. And we struggle to connect relationally, to communicate in that way. We communicate just basic personal information. I want to tell you something about myself. I want to trust you with me. And sometimes we don't even get to that part. There's romantic or intimate communication. I want to tell you something about you that I love about you. We communicate for so many different reasons. But here's what we'll find is that when communication breaks down at any level, it affects every level. And it affects the relationship. It affects the marriage in a negative way. Way. There was a study done by a psychologist and relationship specialist named Dr. John Gottman, and he found this. This was so fascinating that just by studying a couple's communication, he could determine, that, uh, he could determine um, their divorce or, or, or predict divorce up to a 93% accuracy just by watching them communicate, just by seeing how they communicate with one another. Because here's what he found. How they talked to each other determined whether the relationship grew or it was destroyed. He discovered that healthy communication is the key to a healthy and lasting marriage. Do you know what? We shouldn't be surprised by this. This isn't like, oh my goodness, Dr. John Gottman, he's a genius, right? No, God told us this a long time ago. One of the wisest men to ever walk the earth was a guy named King Solomon. He asked God for wisdom. God gave him wisdom because he asked for wisdom. And then God used him to record some of that wisdom in the book of Proverbs. And in Proverbs 18, he tells us about the power of our words. Look at it with me in Proverbs 18, verse 21. It says, the tongue can bring life or death. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. The tongue has the power to build up or break down, to cultivate or to destroy. You, know, you, you want to know how to tell? What are, what are the consequences? Is the relationship getting better or is it getting worse? See, see the way that we communicate will determine so often the direction and the health of our relationships, our words matter. Regardless of our situation, words will either help or hurt a relationship. So today, here's what I want us to do. I want us to look at at, at some principles from scripture on some keys to healthy communication. And here's why, because healthy communication leads to healthy relationships. 
So if you're not taking notes, take notes now, all right? Because unlike Freebird, we believe he can change, that God can change us, all right, as we begin to apply his truth to our lives. All right, so healthy communication leads to healthy relationships. So for a few minutes, I want to talk about this healthy communication. Again, this passage is not directed at just married people. This passage is actually directed to all believers. It, it was written by a guy named James, who was one of Jesus' half-brothers, all right, he, which is pretty fascinating if you think about it. He saw the life, death, resurrection of Jesus, and then he believed Jesus after he saw the resurrected Jesus. That's pretty good proof that Jesus did what he said he did, all right? He didn't believe Jesus before he, until he saw him raised from the dead, and then he followed him and gave his life for him. To, 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 for the gospel, to tell others about him. But in James, uh, God used him to write this letter to a group of Jews that were scattered throughout the region because of persecution. And he's encouraging them how to live out their faith in the midst of persecution. But in James 1.19, he tells us about how do we communicate in a way that, that will build healthy relationships. Look at it with me today, verse 19. It says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to get angry. And listen, if you're going check, check, and check, then you're done. You can head out today, all right? You don't have to stay. But I imagine most of us, if you're like me, man, this is, this is challenging. And so today I wanna look at, at four keys to healthy communication. The first one, see here, so you gotta be quick to listen. That, that that's gotta become priority, that you become Quick to listen. And to help us today to communicate this, we have our own play card for healthy communication. And the first uh, icon is, is the Beats icon, all right? If you don't know what this is, Beats is a company that makes high-end headphones that uses high-tech te technology to deliver the best quality sound. But one of the things that they specialized in uh, early on was noise-canceling technology. So, so you could put it on and not have to hear anything else. It was amazing, all right? As a, as a dad of young children, it was amazing. Um, but you could put it on, and it cuts out the noise. In fact, one of their communications or, or their promotions or the way they advertised was this. Hear what you want. Hear what you want. Block out the noise. Now, that's what they meant by that statement. But here's what happens in our own lives is that we hear what we want, right? We're not quick to listen. We just hear what we want. Like when I tell my son, when I'm coaching him, he's quarterback, and I say, all right, I want you to look at the short routes first. Then if they're not open, look at the deep routes. What did he hear? Throw it deep. Throw it deep every time, right? That's all he hears. Why? Because we hear what we want. We hear what we want. It creates a filter for what people say to us. James saying, you got to learn to be quick to listen. And actually, that when you look at the, what that phrase, the weight of the meaning that phrase carries, it carries this weight that you've got to be eager. It's like sitting on the edge of your seat waiting to receive, right? Be eager to listen with the intent of understanding. Not just, hey, did you hear what I said? And be able to just repeat it back. <laughs> I'm very good at that. I'm struggling with the second part of that. With the intent of understanding of wanting to know more, to hear the heart behind what's being said. See, so often we fail to listen because we already have a mind of what we think they already mean, what we want them to mean. We have a filter through which we hear. And James said, you got to learn to be quick to listen because when we don't, we make a fool of ourselves. Look at how God said in, in, in later on in uh, chapter 18 or earlier in chapter 18, of Proverbs, he says, spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. If you just say the first thing that comes to your mouth, if you just respond without thinking and listening, without being eager to listen with the intent of understanding, you make a fool of yourself and it is a stupid decision is what he's saying. But we struggle with that, right? Because we just, a lot of reasons we struggle to be eager to listen, right? For one, let's just get this out of the way. We're distracted. We live with like constant distraction, we fill our lives with more distraction and we wonder why we're distracted, right? Distracted by phones and TVs. We're distracted by the, the way we want to respond and our rebuttal and to tell our own, uh, own side of the story. We're distracted. So we don't really hear and understand. Man, we're disinterested. Let's be honest. Sometimes you're like, man, this has nothing to do with me. I couldn't care less. Why are we having to sit here and listen to it? So you listen passively. And 
maybe you don't, you, you miss out on hearing the heart behind what's being said. You struggle to hear what they're really trying to communicate. Sometimes it's just, just that we get defensive. Like they say that one thing that triggers you or makes you angry and all of a sudden you don't hear anything else they say. It all goes through that filter and, and it's over. Don't be nudging each other or shooting each other side eyes, all right? <laughs> get defensive. Here's what I found. When we have a failure to communicate, it's typically a failure to listen because we don't listen well. And, and you know what else I found is that some of the best communicators I've ever been around are the best listeners. They know how to listen with the intent. They know how to ask questions to better understand. Like, like I've never felt more heard. You know what else I've found is some of the best leaders I've ever been around are the best listeners. Great listeners make great leaders. Why? Because they're listening to the heart of the people that they're trying to lead. So they know how to connect at a heart level. If we're gonna have better communication, we've gotta first of all learn how to be quick to listen. Look at the verse with me again. Says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. The, the, the sign on our, our play card for this is the sloth. Have you ever seen a sloth? I mean, I've heard about sloths. I saw a sloth a couple years ago when I was in Vienna, and I was amazed. I really didn't know. I mean, I heard that sloths move slow, but it was fascinating how slow they actually move, right? But not only that, you saw the movie Zootopia, anybody, right? There's a, there's a little rabbit police officer who goes into the DMV to get some information, right? And, and behind the counter at the DMV is a sloth character, right? And nothing happened fast with the sloth. The, I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna do that whole time. But, <laughs> It's not about being uh, speaking slowly. It's about being slow to speak, not just saying the first thing that comes to our mind, that we slow down and understand that our words carry weight, that our words matter. And in fact, two chapters later in James, uh, he, he tells us more about the power of the tongue. He says, hey, your tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth. It can steer your entire life. It's like a small rudder on a ship that, that will determine the direction of the entire ship. Then he says it's like a small a spark in a forest that can set the entire forest on fire. It is a shame that out of the same mouth that we praise God, we can turn around and curse the very people that were made in his image. He goes, it shouldn't be that way. It, it, we shouldn't praise God and then turn around and hurt people. Why does that happen? Because we're quick to speak. We react emotionally rather than responding thoughtfully. L look what God tells us about our words in, in Proverbs again. He says, wise words are like deep waters. Wisdom flows from the wise like a bubbling brook. That if we learn that, to, to be slow to speak, that maybe that could be us. That when we speak, it, it like brings life to other people. It builds other people up. That, that it helps other people. It's purposeful. It's meaningful. But then he also says this, that fools, words, get them into constant quarrels. They are asking for a beating. <laughs> that fools find themselves in constant conflict because of the things that they say. And if you're going, man, there's conflict in all the relationships around me. Common denominator could be you. It says it just leads to constant conflict. It says the mouths of fools are their ruin. They trap themselves with their lips. Here's what he wants us to understand is that our words absolutely matter. That we're gonna, we need to be slow to speak because our words carry weight. We need to slow down and weigh our words. Because when you don't weigh your words, you will wreck your relationships. If you don't weigh it before you say it, you will wreck your relationship. So I want to give you a couple of questions to ask yourself before you say something, a way to slow down, and be slow to speak. The first question is this, should it be said? Should it be said? And you may be thinking, yeah, 
They offended me. I needed to set the record straight. I needed to get them back. I needed to settle a score. All of which are terrible reasons to say something. Should it be said, like, ask yourself, what's the purpose? What am I trying to accomplish? What am I trying to achieve by what I'm trying to say? Will it do anything good? Will it build up or will it break down? Will it bring life or death? So I don't ask, should I say it? There's a guy that we talk about often, a guy named Paul. God radically changed his life and then used him to write much of the New Testament scriptures that we have today. And in Ephesians 4.29, he gives us kind of a filter to determine, should it be said? Look at it with me. It says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. So here's the filter. Should it be said? Well, is it foul or abusive language? Not just bad words, but is it, does it abusive? Does it hurt someone? Does it tear them down? Is it aimed to make them feel bad? Then maybe not. Is, is it good and helpful? Does it build a person up? Does it encourage them? Will it, will it help them? Will it bring life to them? Maybe so. And, and there's some things we may go, well, well what, if, what if it feels like it's neutral? Well, I'll just say this. There are still some things that may not go through this filter that still don't have to be said. And here's what I mean. Uh, guys, this, this is what I mean. I'm totally learning this too, is that she doesn't always need my solution. She needs my care. And, and women, he doesn't need your instruction or your opinion all the time. Often he just needs your praise and respect. Should it be said? And the second question to ask is this, should it be said now? Like timing is everything. Just to ask roadkill right? Timing absolutely matters. In the midst of high emotions and crisis, it's not the time to try to determine who was right and who was wrong and who should have done it a different way. It is definitely not a good time for correction and it's not a good time to make life-altering decisions. In the midst of friends, is not the right time to discuss the faults and failures and shortcomings and your frustrations that you have with your spouse. Timing matters. So sometimes we need to learn to delay so that we can respond thoughtfully rather than react emotionally. Delay, not dismiss. When you dismiss, it just, it, it builds up and becomes resentment. But delay so that you can respond thoughtfully. The third question is this. How should it be said? How should it be said? Listen, there's some things that should never be communicated over text message, all right? You, you, we gotta stop doing that, all right? We, we need to start saying, hey, listen, I don't know that I fully understand, so can we, can we talk about this in person so I can ensure that I understand where you're coming from better? The, the way you communicate matters. D depending on which study you look at, researchers Researchers will tell you that 60 to 90% of all communication consists of body language, eye contact, facial expressions, and tone rather than words. Because we know, we, you know this, we know this, right? That you can say the right thing and you can say it the wrong way, right? And when you say the right thing the wrong way, most of the time it is taken what? The wrong way. The, the way we say things, our tone and our facial expressions and our eye rolls carry an entire meaning of their own, right? For, for example, I can say, way to go. And I can say, way to go. Carry completely different meaning, right? The way we say something matters. We've got to learn to say things in a way that carry the meaning that we intend. So, so for some of this, it means removing emotional statements like always and never because those are rarely true, Notice I didn't say are never true. They're rarely true. Just focus on what is true. There's a pastor named uh, Jimmy Evans who says that truth without love is mean, but love without truth is meaningless. Truth without love is mean. Love without truth is meaningless. So we gotta learn to, to, to say things in a way that is loving, that we'd speak truth and love. Uh, just a few suggestions to, to start out. is by just start telling them, I choose you. I'm on your side. I, I'm for you. And then focus on I, me statements rather than you statements. 
you shouldn't have done that. You hurt me. No, instead, hey, when that happened or when you said that, man, I felt really disrespected and it really made me feel unloved. And you focus on I, me statements, how you say it matters. We've got to learn to slow down, be slow to speak. The next, let's look at that uh, verse again and look at the next one. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. <laughs> this is where some of us, we struggle sometimes, right? Because we're much more like an icon over here, like the angry bird, right? Now, if you don't know what this is, there's a game on, on the smartphones where you shoot the angry bird at a structure and it blows up and it destroys the structure. And here's what's happening in many of our relationships is that we are quick to get angry and we explode and we destroy the relationships that we're working so hard to build. It's destructive. It's damaging. He's saying, listen, you gotta be slow to get angry. How do we do that? Well, God tells us how to do that in his letter uh, from Paul to the, to the Colossians, Colossians 3. He says, since God shows you to be holy people, he, the holy people he loves, he, you've put your faith in him. You're one of his own. He says, now you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, that you would put on these traits, that you'd be kind and gentle and patient and loving. He goes on and says this, to make allowance for each other's faults. You're basically saying, I know you're gonna mess up, so I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a, a long rope to work with. I'm gonna pre-forgive you. I'm gonna give you a line of credit, right? I'm gonna make an allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Here's, here's the truth about it. This is what grace looks like. And grace makes space for the faults of others. Grace makes space for the faults of others. Mercy is not giving something that someone deserves. Grace is giving someone something that they don't deserve. And that's absolutely what God has done for us. See, when we do this and we act in this way, it is reflecting the story of God's grace in our lives. He was kind. He was merciful. He is patient. He is loving. We sinned against God. Our sin broke our relationship with God. And when we sin, it's, it's just us where we rejected God and his way for our lives. And because of our sin, we are cut off from God and, and, and we deserve death and eternal separation from him. But God in his great mercy did not give us what we deserved. And instead he gave us grace when he sent Jesus to die in our place so that anyone, regardless of what you've done or where you've been or the family you, rose up, you, you grew up in, regardless of how long that you've gone your own way, that any Anyone who would put their faith in him could be saved and offered forgiveness and a new life through Jesus Christ. That's a picture of grace. How do you do it? By being tender hearted, merciful, kind, gentle, loving. And he comes into our lives and he gives us the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out. And it doesn't mean we'll never sin again, but it does mean that we're forgiven and free and his grace makes space for our faults. He's slow to get angry. And he wants us to reflect his grace and his love as we choose to be slow to get angry in our relationships. And here's, here's why he says that's important, because the human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Because it doesn't produce the kind of life that honors God. That human anger that doesn't, doesn't produce the kind of life that honors God, but more importantly than that, when you begin to live God life the way that God designed, life is just better. When you live a life that honors God, there's peace, there's purpose, there's meaning, there's healthier relationships. He says it absolutely matters. But here's what I know, and we, we all know this. We're not gonna get this right all the time. We're, we're gonna mess up. We're gonna produce the kind of life that doesn't honor God from time to time. We're, we're going to be quick to speak or slow to listen or quick to get angry, right? And the fourth key to healthy communication is simply this, that we'd be quick to repair. Quick to repair. When I was a kid, man, if I broke something, I went and I found the duct tape because duct tape fixed everything. I was quick to repair. 
We've got to be quick to repair. And I'm, I'm not talking about a quick fix to a relationship. I mean a meaningful repair. We slow down. You admit that you made a mistake, that you admit you're wrong, which means that you're going to have to go first, which we struggle with that because they did something too, right? I want you to tell you the thing that God has put in my heart is that God's only going to hold me accountable for me. And he's only going to hold you accountable for you. So be quick to repair. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't, don't get to a place like Justin Bieber where you go, is it too late now to say sorry? All right, <laughs> say sorry. Apologize and own it. Don't, don't try to go, well, I'm sorry you felt that way. That's not owning it. Don't say, I, I'm sorry I felt, you've, I, I'm sorry I did that, but you, no, 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 that's justifying it. Say, I'm sorry I said it. I'm sorry I did it. It was wrong. Will you forgive me? Be quick to repair. Do your part to repair what was damaged. That's part of healthy communication. And this is why it matters, because healthy communication leads to healthy relationships. And ultimately, that's what we're looking for. That, that makes marriage better. That makes a relationship with others better. It makes life better. So I want to give you some homework this week as we wrap up real quick. Write this down real quick. Three things to do this week to cultivate meaningful conversations. First of all, Number one, dream together. You may not be able to do this this week, but, but make a plan to do this at some point, that you get together and you just say, all right, let's talk. Let's get away for a weekend. Let's give, send the kids to mom, dad, cousin, uncle, whatever. But, but you, just you and her. What, what's our dreams? What's our priorities for our family this year? What's our goal relationally? What's our goal spiritually? What's our goal uh, in, in our parenting that we can work together to help launch our kids? What are we gonna do re recreationally and what are we not gonna do recreationally so we can maintain our priorities? What's gonna matter most to our family? And you pre-decide the decisions that later on in marriage some, sometimes create conflict that when you face those decisions, you've already decided. You've pre-decided and you're already on the same page. Set aside time to dream together. The second one is this. Designate time daily. Take 30 to 60 minutes a day that is a no phone zone. No screens, no kids. Sit down and talk for 30 minutes to 60 minutes a day. And some of you are going, well, what do you talk about? That is an indication that you need to do this this week. All right? And it's not so much about talking. It's about learning to listen. It's about learning to ask questions. It's about learning to listen with the intent of understanding. Set aside time daily to do that. And the last one is this. Make personal deposits. Be intentional on a daily basis. Not weekly, not every now and then. A daily basis. Take five minutes to write a note, to send a text, to make a phone call, and make a personal deposit into that relationship. Hey, I love you because. Hey, one of my favorite memories of us is this. I love watching you parent our kids because. I love the way you, you, you interact with your parents for this reason. Because here's what you'll find. When you begin to make deposits into that relationship, it changes the way you listen to each other. Because when you know the other person is in your corner and they are for you, it changes the way that you're able to listen with the intent of understanding. So this week, practice that. And if you're not married, get a group of people that you're close with and just adjust this. For, for, for that group of people to build those relationships because healthy communication leads to healthy relationships. Today, if you've never put your faith in Jesus to save you, and, and, and today you say, man, I need to receive that. That's where I need to start. I mean, there's no reason to wait. You can make the decision right now. I believe God's speaking to your heart right now, and you know it. You simply have to admit that you sinned, believe Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin. You rose from the grave. Come to a place where you go, I don't want to do things my way anymore. I want to follow you, Jesus. Take over my life. I surrender. I want to follow you. Today, if that's the decision you need to make, just tell them right there from where you are. And I want to lead you in a prayer. The prayer doesn't save you, but it's a way to vocalize your decision today and a way to mark that decision in your life. So if that's you, as we, as, as we close today, I want to lead you in a prayer, just a way of telling God in your own words. We bow your heads and close your eyes. Tell them something like this. God, I know that I've sinned. I believe Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of my sin, and that he rose from the grave. Today, I give you my life. 
I know I need you. So today I receive your forgiveness and your gift of grace. And I ask you to change me through the power of your Holy Spirit from the inside out. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. And God, my prayer today for those of us who, who, who are feeling lonely, they feel like it's a struggle to connect or maybe, maybe a, a marriage relationship that's struggling. Father, will you heal those relationships today as we begin to take steps to communicate in a healthy way? As we trust you with that and we follow your, your word and your wisdom, I pray that you'll create and cultivate healthy and thriving relationships and marriages and that the world will see a story of your grace and the way that we demonstrate grace in our relationships. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.